Good evening, everyone. My name is David Streb. I am the Director of Engineering at ODOT. I'd, on behalf of the Department of Transportation, I'd like to welcome everyone here to the Coca-Cola Event Center. Uh, this evening, we want to visit with everyone about the uh, Oklahoma City Boulevard connecting uh, Interstate 40 to downtown Oklahoma City. A few pieces of uh, housekeeping before we get going. I uh, wanted to make sure that everyone picked up a handout and a comments sheet when they came in. Is there anyone that does not have a handout or a comment sheet? Raise their hand and we will get you one right away. I think Frank's walking through and has some extra handouts if you uh, don't have one. Also wanted to let everybody know the PowerPoint presentation that we're going to have this evening shortly is already available on the ODOT website, so don't feel like you have to frantically take notes. Uh, it'll be available on the website to review or print out at your convenience. Also, following our formal presentation, which we anticipate to last around 30 minutes, we'll have a short question and answer session. So uh, that's kind of what we have in store for us this evening. Uh, the Department of Transportation is excited about this project, working in partnership with the City of Oklahoma City. And I think we're just going to tag team the presentation and hopefully when you walk out of here you'll have a little more information about the uh, new boulevard than you had when you came in. And uh, for the Department of Transportation, I'm honored to uh, introduce our Chief Engineer and Deputy Director, Mr. Gary Evans, and I think he, he would like to open up the meeting with a few comments. Mr. Evans? All right. Can everybody hear me? All right. I just want to say I appreciate everybody being here tonight. Uh, you know, it's a unique opportunity here in Oklahoma City for us all to work together uh, towards what's kind of a one-time one -time opportunity. So I want to say I appreciate you being here. There's been much discussion recently about the boulevard, and uh, I hope we've done a good job of communicating with the public, but I fear that maybe we haven't. So I want to apologize on behalf of the department if we have not done a good job of communicating. We hope to resolve that. Uh, tonight and going forward from this point. Again, I think we're all on the same page here. All we want is what's best for Oklahoma City. I live in Oklahoma City, my family does, all of you do. We really want what's best and we have to work through the process in order to get there and that, that uh, I hope is what we get uh, moving forward on tonight. There's going to be some presentations tonight that talk about background, history, how we got to where we're at uh, at this point so far. And then we're going to ask you for some input. And we need your input on this because we can't stand up here and just make these decisions. We make these decisions based on what we reflect that we hear from the public. So you need to uh, give us the message and we need to accept your message and receive your message tonight. So please help us out with that. As I look at it from ODOT's perspective, we've kind of gotten to the end of the environmental process some years ago. This has been a long-term discussion. So back in about 2003, we had what's called a record of decision. And if we want to change that record of decision, we have to have public meetings like this, get the input, and then alter that record of decision. The record of decision really had two conclusions on it. One is that the boulevard would be a six-lane facility, and secondly, that it would be within the footprint of the existing old, now the old crosstown. So if we don't want that to be a six-lane facility, and I know many of you do not, then we need comments relative to that tonight. A comment something like, I understand that the record of decision said six-lane, but we would prefer it to be four-lane. I've even seen some preferences of it not being built in certain sections of that. It's those types of inputs that you need to give to us, we need to have on record so that we can reflect those back in our planning as it goes forward. As far as being inside the existing footprint, that's what the record of decision said. If we want to look at alternates that are outside of that, and many of the alternates that I've become aware of are outside of that, then you need to make that suggestion to us that we look at alternates that are outside the footprint. Again, so we can reflect that back to you all when we look forward in the project. So please help us out on those two points. Those are the two points that we really need to move forward with. I've been following a lot of the blog sites, so I understand the discussion that's been going on. I think it's a healthy discussion. Again, I think we're all working towards the same goal, and we have a one-time opportunity to get this right. Let's please work together. 
ODOT and the city are working together. I know the city is looking for some consulting help from outside to make sure that the plan goes forward successfully. So please help us with that. We'll, we've got some stuff set up tonight to look at uh, uh, different plans that have been put in place and they're gonna see some presentations. But again, let's make this a positive meeting. Make sure you get the opportunity to, to voice your opinions. We want to hear them, we need to hear them. And let's make sure that we do what's best for Oklahoma City. Thank you. Uh, before we introduce the next speaker, I would like to take this opportunity now that we've been in the room for a few minutes um, so that I don't miss anyone. I would ask that all of our elected officials that are here tonight, if they could please stand up, all of our elected officials. Let's give these folks a big hand. The next speaker I'd like to introduce is Mr. Paul Green. He is our Division IV engineer, uh, responsible. He just has a real small job. He's responsible for the largest construction project in the state of Oklahoma, i.e. the I-40 Crosstown Expressway and the demolition of the old Expressway Bridge. And Paul's going to give us an update on, on where we are with that activity. Paul? Thank you, and I appreciate everybody being here tonight. Hey, this is a great opportunity. Uh, I've had the privilege of working for the people of Oklahoma for 29 years, and to have a project of this scale and this magnitude is, uh, is a privilege to us, and, and we hope to get it right and, and do everything that, uh, for the citizens of Oklahoma and the people of Oklahoma City. Uh, we did feel like this meeting isn't, isn't about the construction, but we felt like it was important that we uh, update you a little bit on what's going on out on the, the highway. Uh, we have four current projects that are working, in progress, we have one down on the east end that is about 87% complete. By the end of uh, December, you ought to see traffic moved over uh, all the lanes open on the westbound lanes at the east end of I-40. Uh, that's a $28.1 million project that uh, built the main line and also built the Lincoln Byers uh, Bridge at that point. We have several projects down on the west end that's completing the Agnew area and uh, the westbound lanes actually. All the lanes on the, the west end of the project are actually flowing on the eastbound, line, eastbound side. So uh, it's very important that we get that opened up. When that opens up, well, it'll also open up a westbound on-ramp so, uh, from Penn and, and uh, that area. So we're excited to get that underway. Again, that probably will be completed sometime around uh, December, the end of December. Uh, they're working very hard. They're working on the grading and paving down at that end right now. On the east end, they're paving some of that. Uh, and on the east end, that also includes some of the ramps. We'll get some of those ramps tied in. They're in temporary configurations right now, so that's a big deal. Uh, just out here to the south of us, you'll see uh, we're going great guns on our deconstruction. Uh, we often call that the, one of the biggest uh, recycling projects in the nation, and I believe it probably is. It's a great deal. We've already had a, one bridge completed uh, in a county, in Stevens County, uh, utilizing the beams from the old Crosstown Expressway. So uh, out of 1,910 beams on this bridge, we have 1,599 of them taken down. Uh, 1,547 of them are delivered to 22 sites around the state. And uh, we've removed the concrete from 112 out of 121 spans. So uh, I've got to give kudos to the contractor out here. They're about 84% complete, but now they are working on a very difficult part right now uh, over Shields. So uh, we're seeing a lot of great uh, movement there. On the west end, uh, there was a flyover bridge that we built as part of the uh, uh, construction for the main line, I-40. It's actually a flyover bridge that will connect the boulevard uh, to the new Interstate 40, and it's about a $9.2 million project. It's about 61% complete. And again, sometime in December, we would look for that to be complete. So by the end of this year, you will see a great difference in how the highway flows and the progress on the, on the projects that are out here. Uh, we certainly look forward to completing those projects. We look forward to being able to move forward on this. You know, when we opened the new I-40, we got a lot of comments about needing more access. So that's kind of uh, driven us through the process of trying to find some 
extra ramps and some things to, uh, to accommodate the traffic moving in and out of downtown. Again, those comment forms are the most important thing you'll have tonight. We uh, appreciate you filling those out and giving us your input. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Now, if we could, uh, I want to go through some of the uh, little bit of background on this project and how we got started. And if we could, before this project started, it was originally kicked off in 1995, and we had our first public meeting at the Myriad Convention Center uh, in uh, January of 1996. And back then, I did not have a single gray hair, not one. Uh, I think I have a head full now. It's been a, it's been a long time coming, uh, but I do want to say uh, we received a tremendous amount of uh, public comment back then as we were going through, uh, going through the process on deciding where the interstate was going to go. We expect the same type of public comment as we look at what the boulevard needs to look like. It may not be quite as extensive, but I think the same, the same types of discussion, the same type of evaluation uh, needs to take place. Talk a little bit about some of the project history. It took us approximately two years to go through all of the studies uh, associated with that. And all of those studies included uh, anything from traffic, the financial analysis, NOID study, and that didn't even include where the best alignment was. We looked at every possible way to get I-40 through Oklahoma City from the existing alignment all the way down to the river. A lot of contentious meetings, a lot of consensus building, and I think it was worth it all. Uh, we arrived, I think, at a very good decision, a very sound decision, and it's, an, it's a facility that we're driving on today. But one of the things I wanted to highlight is at that time, all of these options we looked at, and the alternate D, which was essentially recommended in 1998, all included the boulevard connection. All of them had that. And just so no one thinks we're storying to them, or we're filling them full of hot air, or questioning their history, in the back, and there's some folks back there now, we have the old model that was built in 1998 by Oklahoma State University architectural students to give the public an idea of what the future crosstown was going to look like. We had to brush, brush some dust off of it. There were a few cobwebs. But from a historical perspective, it's amazing to me how much what we are building and have open to traffic was similar to what was laid out uh, in that model in 1998. Uh, that model was on display at the opening of the Bricktown Ballpark, where I think about 15,000 folks came by and took a look and gave us some comments. Once the department came out and said, hey, we want to go with alternate D, which swung the interstate a little bit south, Oklahoma City then embarked on a land use and mitigation plan study. And that study was to say, hey, Oklahoma City, how are we going to plan for our future now that the interstate is going to move? Traffic patterns are going to change. How can we project our growth and what's going to happen there? So ODOT kind of backed up and let the city of Oklahoma City complete that study. And it was some of those recommendations that were actually put forward into the final environmental impact statement, which was uh, released in the fall of 2001. Shortly after that, the record of decision came from uh, the Federal Highway Administration. And what does that mean? Uh, Mr. Evans touched on that a little bit. That is the formal document from the Federal Highway Administration that allows us to move forward with the project, both in the final design and the purchaser right away. So if we're going to do something different than that on the boulevard, than what was in here, we need to kind of back up and, and, and take another look at that. This uh, record of decision included four major points. And uh, the first one, the obvious one, the construction of the Interstate 40, it's already been done. It's open to traffic. We also had to have architectural similarities to the Little Flower Church. And if you take a ride on the new Crosstown today, you may not be aware of it, but a lot of the the, some of the stamped concrete and, and some of the pylons, they're in concert and similarity to the Little Flower Church, which was, which was representative of the Hispanic community in South Oklahoma City in the Riverside neighborhood. That was committed to in this document. We also uh, committed to the construction of a six-lane boulevard. 
uh, connecting to the interstate. And lastly was the commitment to the construction of a pedestrian bridge. All of those things were clearly identified in the environmental document. Here is the exact wording highlighted in yellow out of that environmental document which spells out that six lane boulevard. Now one of the keys here, the boulevard is one of those things that we're going to be talking about tonight, but I want to, I want to go back and say, hey, changing this environmental document, it is required and it is something we need to do, but it isn't like it's something we haven't done before. If you look at this project, we've had a series of things that have come to us from the city of Oklahoma City, both their requests and the community as things have changed over time. The first of those is the Skydance Pedestrian Bridge. The Oklahoma DOT had envisioned a pedestrian bridge on the west side of the Union Station. City of Oklahoma City wanted something more iconic, uh, something that would really make a mark on Oklahoma City and felt it was better to put it on the other side of Union Station. We backed up, we updated the environmental document, and lo and behold, uh, we have the Skydance Bridge open and, and, and what a sight to see uh, crossing the Interstate 40. Secondly, we also provided additional access to Agnew. There were concerns of the stockyards area that they didn't have enough access in our original document. We backed up, provided that additional access at Agnew on the uh, interstate. And, and lastly is the Lincoln Byers Connection. That also, the Lincoln Byers Connection, which is in place today, was not a part of the original environmental document. So I wanted to use this as an example to show there are three cases of things where we have already backed up and made amendments to the environmental document. And this evening, part of the reason we're here, probably the biggest reason is, in the environmental document in 2002, we committed to a six-lane boulevard. And our partners at Oklahoma City, working in concert with the Department of Transportation, have taken a look at that, and we've seen a tremendous, tremendous amount of growth since then. Let's take a look at some of these things. Construction of the Devon Tower, the Chesapeake Arena. We we're talking about an intermodal hub at the Santa Fe Depot downtown. The future connection to the new convention center. Project 180, the core to shore project in the park and all of the things that are going with that. These things were a lot of them may have been in infancy, and I contend a lot of these weren't even thought of in 2002 when the record of decision was designed. So if we think that the four-lane boulevard is the appropriate approach, a more park-like atmosphere, slowing traffic down, uh, those are the types of comments that, that we want to hear this evening. We're also well aware of the complications in the western class in Reno area where we had envisioned a bridge, short bridge structure to get a direct, direct shot to Walker is the appropriate decision in 2002. If it is not the appropriate thing to do today and we need to look at some other things, that's what we need to hear about tonight. And I wanna call on Eric Wenger, who's been our partner on this. Eric's the Public Works Director at City of Oklahoma City and Eric will walk us uh, through a little more uh, conceptually on what's being looked at for the boulevard. Thank you. Eric? Thank you, David. Um, I think one of the things is, as we look at this partnership project between the City of Oklahoma City and ODOT is, is just that. It's been something that, uh, that we've been working in place for several months. I think there's many that think that maybe this just started yesterday, but to actually last fall ODOT approached us that they were starting to look forward into the design and there were some design charrette meetings. There's a few things that I'll show you as a part of the presentation that I have for you, these next few slides that were also addressed to our city council. But I think as we go forward into this, realize that, that some of the slides that I'll show, these are very conceptual in nature. A lot of them have to deal with alignments. There's still a lot of decisions yet to be made. And, and I think as we support our, our partners at ODOT, um, their input uh, from you is, is vital. Their input to us, the city of Oklahoma City, is vital. Um, to make sure that we get this right. And uh, obviously with the deconstruction well underway, there's, there's a lot of progress that's already being made. Um, but as we work and go forward, um, there's, there's just tremendous opportunity to, to develop, to make sure that we plan this properly, but that we also make sure that we address a lot of the traffic concerns that are occurring downtown. If we look at the alignment, um, and these are the, the areas that Oklahoma City has started looking at specifically. We'll go to the next slide. The boulevard is actually going to be constructed in a series of projects, and so as we, as we look at this, this ten and a half block um, construction project, uh, and I'll draw your attention to the center, there's a west section, there's the section that we're talking about at Western, Classen, and Reno, 
There's the core section that goes through the downtown core. There's a railroad bridge. Obviously, the boulevard is going to go under that bridge. The former I-40 went over that. And then there's the east end that goes through Bricktown. The project's been broken down into these categories, and, uh, and two of those, um, the west end and the east end, are ones that make those major connections back to our interstate system. For those that have experienced some of the downtown recently and some of the challenges that we have, we have significant challenges at Western Avenue in the evenings and in the mornings. We also have significant challenges after major events downtown like uh, Thunder Games. And so there's a tremendous amount of congestion that is a part of the boulevard should be alleviated with new connections going to the west and to the east, both at Western and also at EK Gaylord to supplement what's already there. Um, some of the other options that we have, as you look at the slide bullets at the bottom, Third Street in Oklahoma City, and the old Interstate 40 are actually parallel to one another. And as David mentioned, one of the things that the city is supporting is a four-lane boulevard. With it being a much narrower street, even though it may have a median that might be as wide as 40 feet, there's a tremendous amount of real estate that could be possible on both the north and the south side of this new boulevard to encourage future development. So obviously that's very important as we continue to grow downtown, as we continue to look at the Court Shore area, and we start talking about some of the MAP3 projects like the new downtown park and the new convention center. The other opportunity that we have is to further enhance our walkability in downtown. And so another one of those project goals from Oklahoma City is to have wider sidewalks. And what we're looking at right now are 15 foot wide sidewalks along both sides of the boulevard. The west section, um, as I walk through these, and I'll, and I'll go through these quickly. I think if you had an opportunity to, to see our city council meeting, this is also on the city's website at okc.gov if you'd like to go back and see some of their comments. These are actually the same slides that have been previously presented. But the Penn to Western connection, again, will make that new connection back to Interstate 44 to help take some of the traffic load off of the western entrance and exit to the current I-40. Um, it's anticipated to be a rehabilitation, rehabilitation project, but it's going to be very different than the old interstate that we once drove. And so as we work with the comments with ODOT, moving it down from six lanes to four, having a boulevard even in that section, also reducing the speed limit, we would expect that this section to be somewhere around the 45 mile an hour speed limit, not highway speeds, are all those things that are goals for, for Oklahoma City. We're also looking to well landscape this section, again, as an invitation to Oklahoma City. So if you were coming from Will Rogers World Airport, if you were a visitor to Oklahoma City, or if you perhaps were just coming to downtown, we want to make sure that that connection as you come off of the interstate system into downtown is something that's inviting and, and, and entertaining as you're, as you're entering downtown. This is that west section, and uh, if you look on the uh, left-hand side of the page, that would be Pennsylvania Avenue. I know that the, the text is very small, and as David mentioned, you can download this from the ODOT website. This is also available on the city's website. On the right-hand side of the drawing, to give you a visual, that's about Western Avenue. This is existing. Um, it's already an elevated on grade, but you see some of the existing bridges um, that are planned to be maintained. But uh, again, as we look at uh, the different design opportunities, um, this is something that can be well landscaped because it is on dirt. It allows us to plant trees and bushes. It allows us to irrigate those and make this a very attractive green space. As we approach Western Avenue, you're going to see some of those old off-ramps are going to be rehabilitated as well. So there's been some questions about will there be access to Western Avenue if you're coming from the west side of downtown, and the answer is yes. There's going to be the existing entrance exits um, that will put you back onto Sheridan Avenue. There's also the one that you can see that dips down to the bottom of the drawing at Klein. For those that didn't know or maybe didn't use it very often, the on-ramp at Sheridan Avenue is also going to be maintained. We're looking to ODOT to make that a better entrance. You know, it's the one that's hidden in the trees. It's kind of hard to find, but it's a one that a lot of us used to use as we got onto the old interstate. But a lot of those original features that work so well, we're hoping to maintain as a part of our comments. This would be an example of what that west section could look like. So as I show this to you, very, very different than what the old interstate would be. And these are some of the things that our partners at ODOT are receiving from the city. Uh, these again come from those planning workshops. And again, as we look for additional input from, from you tonight, we want to make sure that whatever is constructed um, is what you expect to, to see when this is a completed project. This is the area of Western, Classen, and Reno um, that uh, the city has taken great uh, promise in making sure that we study um, properly. Um, there's been a lot of questions about this section, and, and as I pull up a map of this in just a moment, it's a very congested part of west side of downtown. We've got tremendous traffic volume on Western Avenue. Obviously, this is one of two 
entrances and exits off of the current I-40 into downtown. Classen Boulevard is very busy. Reno Avenue is also a very busy street, but there's a number of other streets that are also in the area, including Sheridan, including Exchange, um, and others as well. And so as we look at the challenges in this area, there's high traffic, but there's also the desire to make sure that we plan and properly provide for new development in the area. So with those challenges, the engineers um, um, have been questioned, and I think as we coordinate with our planning partners, um, we're looking for uh, compromise, something that can work for both, one that can mitigate the traffic concerns, but also one that can ensure that private business owners, future developments in that area are enhanced. Again, there was an original proposal to build this as a bridge. That is just one of the considerations. For those that have maybe followed Friends of a Better Boulevard, there have been roundabout proposals. Um, there's also been some at-grade proposals where there's not a roundabout nor a bridge. But what Oklahoma City has done in following the City Council meeting, and we've received some authorization to move forward, we're looking to engage a consultant that's well rehearsed in each of those areas. And so a national consultant we're currently interviewing a contract with by the name of Stantec. They come with urban planning experience. They are also traffic engineers. They've designed over a hundred roundabouts. Um, and so we found them well qualified and, and we hope to have them under contract in the next couple of weeks. Our goal is to be able to make a report back to the city council with a variety of options, not just one idea um, for consideration. But we hope to come from this process over the next couple of months with a decision that we're allowed to at least go forward with ODOT so that we can proceed with the boulevard. This is that section um, that I mentioned on the, on the left hand side again, you'll see Western Avenue that would start right at the edge of the green to white color change if you're looking from left to right. On the right hand side of the page, um, the white street that runs north and south is Walker Avenue. So to give you some perspective, I think you can see the number of streets that are in that area and this is why this has become such a complicated issue. Obviously, the, one of the easiest solutions is to rebuild the bridge in that area, simply to maintain the existing grid and to have that part of the boulevard be the only real elevated part, um, the rest of it more or less being at grade, um, just to enhance the traffic flow. But again, as we look at opportunities, not all of the streets are busy. There are a lot of busy streets. Is a roundabout a possibility? I think it could be. Um, is an at-grade option a possibility? I think it could be as well. And so as we look forward to this study, um, I think that you'll find some additional opportunities in the future once we have those results from Stantec um, to be able to assist us with this decision. As we move forward through the core section, and I think this is the section that uh, actually probably is the most exciting for Oklahoma City from a perspective of maps three and downtown development. This core section actually runs um, through the core of downtown where the vicinity of the new downtown park would be constructed. It's where the site of the new convention center has been located. Um, it's also near the Chesapeake Arena, and for those that have been watching the, the Chesapeake go under construction, they have a new entry on the southwest corner that will open this next basketball season, fronting the new boulevard. So it's, it's vital that we get this section right with a lot of the developments that are, that are currently underway. You'll see the Chesapeake Arena here on the right side of the drawing. It's the circular building. Uh, the boulevard is, is being proposed on the alignment with the green line. The convention center would be in that large rectangular block that's just left of the Chesapeake and directly due south would be the new Central Park. So obviously the proximity of all these major developments with a boulevard running right between them is important that we ensure that we have those 15 foot sidewalks, that it's walkable. This section also is a section that we're planning to reduce the speed even further down to 25 miles an hour. So again, if there's been questions about whether this is going to be a high speed bypass of the Interstate 40, it is not. You were encouraging downtown traffic to come in, have an experience in downtown through a variety of, of, of venues. Obviously, on other areas of the drawing, you can see the myriad botanical gardens to the top. And as we look out west towards that western area, again, I think there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity for future development. So again, the goals of this area is to enhance uh, the project in such a way that we provide for those intersections and those traffic connections to get you in and out of downtown to provide you an alternative to having to go to Western or EK Gaylord as the only access into and out of downtown to the highway. Some of the visions of this section, again, as we look at Treeline Boulevard, what you would expect in this area is a 40-foot median, perhaps. For those that have driven Reno Avenue, of course, it's just to our south, and so on your way home this evening, you might take a look. Picture Reno Avenue just with a much wider median. We're looking at 11-foot lanes. We're looking at well landscaped areas, but something that we can make iconic for Oklahoma City to make sure that we leave our mark on visitors that come downtown that they've, that they've arrived. 
we're looking at intersections much like we have on Project 180. So again, wide accessible walkways, pedestrian friendliness throughout. This is a, an idea for you to see some of the planning that's underway. Um, so these are some conceptual drawings of what that boulevard might look like at that core section. If you could visualize to the south the park, which hasn't been constructed yet, and if you could visualize to the north the new convention center, one idea is to make sure that we've got a 40-foot median, but also, as you see to the right of the drawing, some sort of an enhanced pedestrian connection to make sure that we're inviting people back and forth, north and south, from the north side of downtown to the new south side, the core to shore area, as many of you may have already heard about. But there's also some other opportunities, and neither one of these decisions have been made, so I preface this as conceptual drawings. There are other opportunities that perhaps if the boulevard or the median were eliminated, you might enhance some new retail development on the south edge of downtown, maybe next to that new convention center. But again, this all goes into that thought process about what is best. No decisions, and there's still a lot of planning ahead of us in the months to come, but these are some of the ideas that are starting to be tossed around in that center section. The railroad bridge is, is quite a challenge, and I think most of us are very familiar with, with the railroad today. It's an elevated structure that, that separates downtown from Bricktown, but as we look at this bridge design, it's, it's, it's important to Oklahoma City for a, a number of reasons. And the first is, is we currently have two connections into Bricktown at Reno and at Sheridan that are quite narrow, and the ceiling height or the, the roof height is actually quite low. This new connection, we're looking at something that's much enhanced, something that has a 16-foot clearance, but again, as we look at those wider sidewalks that will link downtown to Bricktown, a third, a new access that provide opportunities for pedestrians in and out of, of Bricktown area. On the left-hand side of the drawing, you'll see that, that railroad. On the left, um, you'll see the developed Bricktown in the aerial photo, so you can really recognize from this the canal. It's the dark area that kind of meanders. You'll see the ballpark at the top. But again, as we look at opportunities for the boulevard, you'll see the old interstate underneath the blue drawing or the blue lines, and you can see how much narrower the new boulevard is being proposed. And so again, looking at an opportunity at 25 miles an hour through this section going underneath the existing railroad. I mentioned that it's 16 feet clearance. The railroad's already in the air, so the, the road is not going to have to dip 16 feet into the ground. It's not gonna go into a hole. So as you visualize this, and we unfortunately don't have drawings because it hasn't been fully designed, there's gonna be about an eight foot depression in the road, 16 feet total as we go under that bridge. And so again, it's gonna be an opportunity to have easy grades, meaning it's easy to walk or easy to bike back and forth east and west into Bricktown. You'll also see some of the new opportunities for the, for the right of way. You'll see opportunities for future development in Bricktown. Um, we've got a connection that is being proposed um, as we move forward through the railroad bridge into the Bricktown area at Oklahoma Avenue. So as we look at the boulevard and the opportunities that can be provided on the east end, Oklahoma Avenue has an opportunity to reconnect Reno Avenue to the boulevard. Now there was two options that were being considered. I'm gonna go ahead and try this laser, maybe. I'll just point it out to you. So the square box that is on the left side of the drawing where you see the road going north and south, that is the U-Haul building in Bricktown. There is an existing street right away there named Compress Avenue, but as you can see, instead of snaking the road around the building, we'd actually like to consider an option where that would go straight into Bricktown on Oklahoma Avenue. Now, although this is something that's not currently in the plans, I share this as an example of some of the things that we're trying to work with ODOT, and they're allowing us to take the additional time to make sure that we get this right. And so we do believe this is the right decision to make that new connection, um, and so this is something that we're obviously working on in the months to come. But as you move out of the east side of Bricktown, the speed limit would then increase back to 45 miles an hour. It would be at grade until you hit about the middle of the theater. The theater is the large uh, building that you see right in the middle of the drawing. And it would then start to elevate and go back over, over the Bricktown Canal, and it would reconnect to I-35 and uh, I-235 on the east side. So, so to try to visualize this again, as we go from west to east, the speed limit 45 miles an hour until you get into downtown, 25 miles an hour through downtown, and then you would accelerate back over the, the Bricktown Canal to reconnect to the highway at 45 miles an hour again. We're looking at downtown connections at most of the major intersections between Walker and Oklahoma, perhaps more. Some of the studies that are yet to come might determine more intersections are possible. We're looking at a well landscape boulevard, something that's very inviting for downtown. And up to this point, and, and I think that we could expect this in the future, ODOT has received all these comments very well. And, and so these are, these are drawings that have been provided to the city of Oklahoma City from their consultants to share with us. 
And I think with that, I appreciate your time. Um, I know that we're going to be available and uh, for questions. And so, again, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Big question is, if we're going to go into a question and answer uh, from the folks, but what's next? What, are we, what, what lays ahead? From a formality standpoint, we're going to complete an environmental assessment of this boulevard corridor, and that will be presented to Federal Highway Administration for approval. We're using federal money. They, they essentially have the final approval and make sure that, that we're working with the city and coming to the correct solution and have evaluated all the things we need to look at. So that's what's going to be laying ahead of us. Also, if you look at your handout, we will be back with another public meeting, and it will talk about the comments that we've received based on tonight's meeting. It will also discuss some of the recommendations and things that are coming out of the city study, looking at the issue at the Western Reno class and area, whether it's at grade, whether it's a roundabout, whether it's an elevated, a combination. But we need to come back to the public with what some of the recommendations and findings are based on the comments we hear tonight and on what the results are of uh, some of these studies. So I didn't want to leave folks up in the air as far as what's next. Um, one of the slides I showed earlier, and, and a little bit tongue in cheek, we talked about all of the things downtown, and Eric touched on it a little bit, that no one thought of in 2002. We have a very good sports franchise in downtown Oklahoma City now that didn't exist in 2002. I'm talking about the Oklahoma City Barons. <laughs> I know everybody's thinking the Thunder. I go to hockey games. Uh, I'm excited about the hockey, but the Thunder has brought about a tremendous, tremendous revival to downtown Oklahoma City that I don't think anyone could have envisioned in 2002 when we were laying the drawing board down. I think it's remiss if we don't touch on that. A little bit of uh, housekeeping. The comments sheets that you have, uh, Frank will be at the door. Uh, if you would like to leave the comments tonight, you're welcome to do that in writing. If you want to take them with you and think about it and mail them in over the next couple weeks, that would be fabulous. Um, I cannot encourage you enough. We will take comments verbally. We'd like to discuss things with you tonight and take questions, but there's nothing better than a written comment. We don't misinterpret what you're saying. We don't put words in your mouth, and there's no, there's no doubt about it. We can point to those comments and, and really try to understand them. So please, even if you do ask a question verbally or have a comment, we strongly encourage you to put that in writing. Uh, it, it's absolutely the best thing you can do because as we go through this environmental process, those do become an actual official part of the record and, and we really do encourage you to do that. Uh, at this point in time, uh, Eric and I are going to try to answer a few questions uh, from the audience. I also have some key staff members from the DOT up front if uh, we get stumped. Uh, I'd like to take the easy questions and Eric can take the hard questions. Um, but with that, Please, the questions, if you could, keep them on the project as a whole uh, process or as the project as a whole. If you have a question about perhaps an individual property that either you own or are interested in, uh, I would encourage you to meet with us one-on-one -on -one at the drawings. Uh, I think that's perhaps a little more appropriate to, to meet your individual needs as far as those questions go. Um, so with that, if we could, I'd like for maybe the next 10 or 15 minutes to entertain any uh, questions. And I know our folks have microphones. Uh, and we'd ask that you talk into the microphone. Craig? Bear with us. We got four microphones. Yes, sir. Uh, the project life of this boulevard, how long is it supposed to be? In other words, how long is it supposed to be usable? My question is I asked that question because, you know, the city growth, the amount of traffic growth, and now you're going from a six lane to a four lane. Well, traffic's not going to decrease, and this you have a chance to make this be a supplement to I-40 to be able to get traffic on and off of downtown area, but you're reducing it from six lanes to four lanes. You know, and like I said, this can be a supplement, but it's not. It's not going to be a supplement. Uh, it's it's going to basically, you know, and I, I love trees. You know, that's that's a great thing, but why do we need a 40-foot wide median when we can add two extra lanes and help? distribute traffic in Oklahoma City and make it easier for people to get in and out of the Oklahoma City? That's my first question. My second question is, and this pertains to my company, which has been in Oklahoma City for 60 years, okay? If you take the new I-40 and go north 
to Linwood, and then you go from Pennsylvania east to western, in that less than one square mile, there's approximately 400 businesses. When you come westbound on your new boulevard, the only place you can exit is at Klein, which basically makes almost a dead-end T into Reno, right there next to the farmer's market. All right, so no place else can, can people come in there. So anybody coming from the west, okay, is gonna have to go basically a mile past all these businesses and then backtrack a mile. Okay, and then when they get back on, they're basically gonna have to do the same thing and they can go back to western, okay, and get on that little shared loop that comes back in to be able to get to go westbound again. Some of my customers are east of town, some are north, south, and west. But basically from the people coming in from the west, you've eliminated their ability to get to my business. You made it difficult for them, okay? But my main point I wanted to make was the point about the, you know, why are we gonna make it four lanes with traffic increase gonna happen over the next 40 years? Classen Boulevard is a perfect example of the fact that it takes a lot of traffic and it's developed a lot of businesses along that. And I don't see this being able to do that. Thank you. Well, to start on the question, the four lane to six lane is exactly why we're here, sir. The one thing I can assure you on each end uh, where the boulevard ties into Interstate 40 on the east side of Bricktown and also on the west side, um, ODOT won't allow the boulevard to back traffic up onto the interstate. We're going to run enough traffic analysis that people can exit off the interstate without any backup on the interstate. And frankly, to your, to your point also, uh, there's no doubt about it. We're your businesses and your fellow businesses. When we closed the old I-40 and turned on the new I-40, I assume no one knew how to get there anymore off the interstate. You, you had a booger boo ahead of you uh, because everyone had to get off at Western and, and that's exactly why we're trying to get this boulevard connection in because the traveling public will have two choices. They can either do the flyover and come in on this new boulevard, whether it's four or six lanes, or they can exit Western and come north. But I, I do agree, you do have to backtrack a little bit. And the area in question, I think, is the actual the area that uh, the city's gonna be studying. And Eric, I don't know if there's anything you wanna add on that. You know, I think just to further to further discuss that, I think some of the information that uh, ODOT has shared with us is the, the traffic projections have been projected out a number of years. I think some of the models that we've seen are to t year 2030. As we look at the right of way and as we look at the streets that we're talking about uh, uh, building, when the project's finished, the old interstate uh, right of way is actually going to become city right of way. That's part of the the decision to relocate I-40 to the south is that this new boulevard will actually be owned by the city. And when I suggest that is that if we look at future expansion possibilities, I could see in, in 20 years, in 30 years, that there might be opportunities there. But I think that we'll see some new development and make decisions at that time prudent to where development occurs. And so I think it's hard for us to predict all the things that might happen south or west or north of downtown. But there's going to be future adjustments required. Something that I failed to mention that's a part of the boulevard and much what you'll see also on Reno Avenue is that we're also looking to provide parallel parking along the boulevard. Perhaps it's possible, um, and this is similar to what we do on, on Walker today, Walker Avenue that is actually a two-lane road, but we're operating it currently as a four-lane road. It might be easy if we found that there was congestion to eliminate those parking lanes and increase the number of lanes on the boulevard, but I think we've planned a model that's going to allow us to be able to grow and expand in Oklahoma City without too much difficulty. The right-of-way is, is quite large, even though we might be going back with something slightly less than what the old interstate was, we're not planning to put 100,000 cars on the boulevard today. So you know, we expect the traffic volumes to be greatly reduced with the number of connections. I think as we look at the access um, to the Western Avenue area, and as David mentioned, we are looking to, to study that further, but that's why I wanted to mention that those existing ramps are gonna be maintained. So for those that might recall the ramps when the old interstate was in place, the ramp that goes to Klein or the ramp that goes to Sheridan, those will be maintained. We may find some additional opportunities as well through this Western Class and Reno interchange study by, by Stantec. So, thank you. I have a question about the purpose of the boulevard in general. We are looking at walkability for downtown. We're looking to it to be, for it to be pedestrian friendly. If you have a boulevard that's as wide as you're talking about, whether it's the median or the lanes, there is no way anybody on crutches or in a wheelchair is going to get across that traffic in the amount of time you usually give people to get across. They're either going to have to stop in the median and wait for the next light 
or something. I mean, you're talking about a space that is so wide that you can't, it's not something you can normally cross. It's already hard enough to get across um, Walker when you're going to a concert in the amount of time that's given you to walk across. So I, that's something, you're, yeah. the walkability is not being configured into this at all. And, and I would like to go back to the, you know, if we looked at slides, um, that is something that we definitely want to study in that center core. And whether we look at connections between the old Cox Convention Center and the Chesapeake on Reno, or we look at the connections that are going to be a part of the new boulevard, I think pedestrian friendliness is, is top of the list of things that we want to enhance. And so there is a challenge there. We are looking at 11 foot lanes. Um, one of the things of being able to also reduce from six lanes to four shortens that distance greatly um, for pedestrians. The 15 foot sidewalks also help. And so again, as we look to, to make sure that we're properly planned, um, we're trying to take care of every advantage that we can to make the new boulevard a walkable boulevard, either through east-west connections as you traverse from downtown into Bricktown. But again, we're still working on that north-south connection and what that will look like. Um, there's several ideas that are out there on the table, but as we look at the MAPS-3 process and the MAPS-3 subcommittees, you know, there are groups that are looking at the park. There are groups that are looking at the convention center. And I know that's at the top of their list to make sure that we've got that, that walkability um, achieved. And so I think those are things that are yet to come, but definitely comments that we're gonna receive tonight and take forward with us. Thank you. I have a quick question about the western section. First off, why is there a need for an elevated roadway from running from western to Penn Avenue? And second, is the city considering an at grade uh, possibility for the intersection of western class and exchange avenue, maybe in the form of a roundabout? The answer is yes. And uh, as I mentioned, that western class and Reno exchange area, um, there are no decisions that have been made. The one presentation that was made did show a, a bridge spanning that, but, but we have retracted that. That is not the only option. And so as I go back to, to the consultant that the city is hiring, Stantec, they're going to look at all options that include roundabouts, at grade. It might be a combination of the two. It might be at grade with a roundabout. It might be two roundabouts. It might be, I mean, I think the number of possibilities is endless, but with their traffic planning, roundabout experience and a lot of their urban planning. They have urban planners that are on staff. We want to make sure that that solution is the right solution and that's what's also going to be coming forward in the future. So again, I just want to reiterate, no decisions have been made on that being a bridge at all. He asked you two questions. Yeah, what the, you know about the first that? question on the elevation from Penn to Western, um, touch on that a little bit. And I think, it, I think there's been a little bit of misperception perhaps on that section. Um, we keep hearing it called elevated and almost referred to it like another bridge. And essentially what was recommended and what we saw up here tonight, it's nothing new. It's the old interstate highway that we've been driving on since 1965. It's the section essentially from May Avenue to where Western is, which was on the ground. It's, it's dirt that's up in the air a little bit. You could call it embankment, but it's never been a bridge section. And I think from a cost and viability perspective, the reason for the recommendation has been a, a lot of it cost driven and a lot because that facility is already in place. And the recommendation is just reducing the lane and putting a lot of aesthetics and trees and greenery in there to slow the traffic down on that section. So I don't want to leave the perception that it's a new elevated section from Western to Penn. But I do think one of the things that uh, they're, not to put words in Eric's mouth, but I think one of the things their consultant will look at is do they want to look at bringing that berm down low so that you do have at-grade intersections essentially or a roundabout at every city street. Now does that answer the question? I'm concerned any time I come to a meeting like this and I see the, the graphics go up uh, where the plan was originally for six lanes and they put the example up in four, it makes me feel like a decision might have already been made. But I'm concerned that build, spending $80 million on an instantly obsolete four-lane road makes no sense. 
We did that with the, with the Hefner Parkway. It, it makes no sense to underbuild to begin with, and you're already talking about all the things that are downtown that people are gonna be coming to. Traffic's not gonna lighten up, and, a three, and three lanes going one way gives you an opportunity to people to turn right, to turn left, and to continue down a center lane unobstructed. Well, thank you. I think, sir, you hit the nail on the head with the, the issue. Um, there's no doubt the, the stakeholders, both our professionals working with the city professionals and the stakeholders and our consultants, the recommendation from the local level was that, and that's why it was presented this evening. The six lane, it's, it's still on the table. It's what has been approved so far, and it's that type of comment and discussion, I think, that we need to move forward with. I just want to make one comment on that. And, and when you look at six lanes and four lanes, having the opportunity to have a, a protected right or a protected left turn at an intersection would not necessarily have to count as a full lane. Those are things that we can take care of intersections without having three through lanes. So when you look at these designs, just keep that in mind. Um, if you look at E.K. Gaylord, for example, coming from the east back to the west, and as you approach E.K. Gaylord on the new boulevard, you're going to see that one of the ideas is to have a right turn, a left turn, but then still two through lanes to that intersection. But it's still two through lanes, but I guess from a perspective of maybe the way you're looking at it, it would be four lanes. So we can do a lot at the intersections to help make sure that turns are safe, to make sure that we've got the ability to still move cars through and not actually enhance this clear back to six lanes. But as we work through the comments tonight, we just need to make sure that we're receiving those comments. I just wanted to share that as well as an option. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm with the National Walking Club and we have a local one here and we have two 10K walks that go through the city and it's kind of scary sometimes to watch them, uh, especially we have a group coming from Nevada in two more months, next month, to walk here and go through the area. And I am very much in favor of the four lane. It just makes it a lot easier for people to walk and get across. And I have two maps to show you where our walks go through in this city. Good evening. Um, first off, thank you for putting this on. I do appreciate it this evening and, and all of the involvement that all of us have the opportunity to have. The, the question for me would be, um, I'm more interested in the four lane for the sheer fact that if you've been to the Boathouse District while you're down here, it is stunning. Bricktown has turned out tremendously well. Downtown is gorgeous. The botanical gardens are gorgeous. Really, if we get tourism in this part of the city, why are we trying to hurry them out? We have. I'm a, I'm a retail business owner. We have I-40 bringing hundreds of thousands of customers a day through our city that are only stopping to purchase gasoline. Why don't we make this attractive so we've got an area for them to drive through? If I'm driving through a four-lane beautiful area, I'm going to continue to drive. If it's six lanes and I'm in a hurry, I'm just moving through. I'm not stopping. So I, I just, mine's more of a point than a question. I apologize for that part. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Patrick Boylan. Um, some of you might think I might be more interested in the East Connection because I live in Centennial Lofts and yes, of course, I'd love for Oklahoma Avenue to be the first dump off because I could drive straight into my parking garage. But I actually have a couple of ideas that I don't think are being considered that I hope your consultant, Eric, um, considers for the, the class in Western Reno debacle. We all know that the elevated uh, overpasses create some sort of blight, don't really contribute to economic development um, along the, the way. And I would like for those of you, and, and I do convention planning worldwide, so I travel extensively, um, but for those of you who know Washington, D.C. very well, if you take a look at DuPont Circle or many of the other roundabouts that are in the D.C. Uh, area, I think that there's a win-win here um, that actually solves the debate about four lane, six lane, and solves the debate about roundabout or no roundabout, and solves the problem of rebuilding an old elevated bridge again or whatever ramped up. 
And that is, I would like to see the boulevard be six lane, and just like Connecticut Avenue does as you're going from the White House straight north up to the Washington Hilton, that the center four lanes go below grade, a word that I have not heard out of anybody at ODOT's uh, mouth or at the city of Oklahoma City, and do an underpass where you'd have no road no noise um, and you can shoot straight through and solve the traffic problem, the outside two lanes would actually stay at grade and go through the roundabouts just as they do at DuPont Circle, Mass Avenue, um, 395 underpass at the U.S. Capitol, um, those kind of things, and get the best of both worlds. Now, I know it costs a little bit more to dig, but if we're going to do this, we want to do it right. And so that's my suggestion for that, and I hope your consultants consider that. The other comment I have is uh, I do understand everybody's concern, especially at the convention center, which is a very important property to me, the Myriad Gardens and the pedestrian bridge, that it be very pedestrian friendly. Um, while it is costly, I think the money will eventually be there with the development. I'd like to see there be pedestrian bridges that go over the top of the boulevard with escalators and elevators at both ends, exactly like Las Vegas Boulevard at the cross in front of Excalibur and um, the Wind Vegas and et cetera, et cetera. Where you're not fighting with traffic at all, you can cross the street at any time that you want, yet there's a beautiful boulevard going down that can be as wide as it needs to be. Final thing is, where you do have the parking spots along the side. Follow the DC model, change those to uh, rush hour lanes from 4 to 7 p.m., make all of those cars get out of there, and it becomes a six-lane boulevard for three hours at night, and it's a four-lane boulevard um, the rest of the day. So those are my suggestions for you. Thank you. I really appreciated what this gentleman and he all, um, both said. Um, first of all, if you're going to raise, you're going to raise the boulevard up. You're going to create a physical or psychological barrier, which is going to separate um, downtown from what is south of the boulevard, which I discourage. And you know, I love trees and I love to drive just as much as the next person. I love glamour and elevators and escalators, all that stuff, but. I, I personally would prefer a more, you know, keep it simple, stupid type of solution. And I mean, just put in street lights, make it four lane, make it pedestrian friendly, make it somewhere where someone's not going to be afraid to stop and get out of their car, you know. And so it's more of a comment than a question. But that's what we're familiar with. This is Oklahoma City. This isn't Las Vegas. We want it to be a place where residents actually want to come to and not say, well, that's way too complicated you know, way too much traffic, you know, it should be a place where it, it encourages pedestrians, it encourage bicyclists, you know. No, you know, I'm, I'm, tired of, I'm tired of the car. I love my car, but, you know, it doesn't need to be the center of attention here. I have a comment and then a question. A lot of you keep referring to blight. You might want to keep in mind that some of those areas, some of the areas, some of the area down around Western Class in Reno that you consider to be blight, we have active businesses going on down there. Mine in particular, I have 12 employees. Some of the plans that I've seen may involve going outside of the right-of-way, which, uh, which would eliminate our facility and very likely cost, cost some jobs. One thing I'd really like to know is, this is my question, specifically what happens Let's say that the right-of-way is expanded and the property that I have is condemned. It's not my property. I lease it and have been in business there for quite a while. How, what's going to happen to us? Are we going to just say, so long, see you later? Are there going to be compensation to help us relocate? I'd like to know specifically what the policies are with the city and the state as far as making sure that our business is able to continue and we can keep the jobs that we've established as a small business in the west part of Oklahoma City. So at this point, the, the right-of-way that is existing is not planned to be expanded. So, um, you know, the existing businesses that are along the old Interstate 40 will be along the new boulevard. And there's no acquisitions that are planned. Um, the only area right now, and I would say that these are in question, depending on what the results are from the Western Class in Reno study, you know, perhaps if the, the solution is a roundabout and it requires additional right-of-way, that's going to have to be taken into consideration. But I say this tonight, that that decision hasn't been made. If we look at the Oklahoma Avenue connection, 
there's additional right of way that would be required for Oklahoma Avenue. So in those cases, I mean, obviously we're going to have to approach those those independent owners um, on uh, once those decisions are made to negotiate purchases. And so, but at this point, if you look at the length of the boulevard in general, other than the area of Oklahoma Avenue and then what may come out of Western Class and Reno, we're not anticipating any any right of way acquisition. I'm sorry, you really didn't answer my question. In the event that there was additional right of way acquisition and property that I have leased is going to be, I understand that the property owner is going to be compensated for their property, but what about the leasee of the property that's running a vibrant business at that location? Am I just going to get the boot or are you going to help me find a new place? First of all, sir, if the, if the, if the property is needed, and I think Eric's saying, you know, we're nowhere near knowing that yet, we do have to follow the Uniform Act. And I want to, I think Diana is in the, Diana, can you stand up and raise your hand? I would ask you, sir, Diana is a, a key member of our right-of-way division, very familiar with that process, and I would encourage you to get with her one-on-one -on -one, uh, as far as the exact processes and, and uh, what the compensation is and, and exactly what that detailed process is. I have a question for Mr. Wagner. I don't understand why you're going to slow the traffic down from Penn for a mile and a half all the way to Lee Dewey. I mean, that's the same interstate we used to drive on. All you're doing is tearing out the inside two lanes and planting a bunch of trees. It's the same roadbed. It's separated by grade. It has limited access. As a matter of fact, there's even less access. You're taking off the ramps at Virginia and Penn. So, this is madness to have that existing elevated roadbed hauling down through there. Who are you putting those trees in the middle for? The people driving the cars? The people in the neighborhoods won't be able to see those trees. They're going to be up there on the same darn roadbed we've been driving on for years. It's not going to help those businesses on either side. You're, you're trying to get that traffic off that interstate to downtown, and for a mile and a half, you are going to do nothing for any of those businesses or any of those people for that mile and a half down that lane. So, I would suggest put that sucker down on the grade, have some intersections, and make it a real boulevard for everybody. Um, the the, the, current, the current goal of the Boulevard project is to enhance that downtown access. So the goal is to bring traffic into and out of downtown. Um, that's, that's subject to change, I guess, based on comments tonight. Um, the reason for decelerating those cars is so that when we get to those first signalized intersections, where the, wherever they occur, like Walker Avenue, that we actually have cars that can stop. So if they're traveling 60 miles an hour, the goal is to actually have safety for pedestrians. And, uh, and I share that tonight as the current vision of the boulevard, um, but I want to receive your comments as well. And I mean, I, we need to receive those tonight and we'll do so. Thank you. Is Steve Mason and I serve as the chairman of the um, Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce Transportation Committee. On behalf of the chamber, I, we appreciate both the city and ODOT's efforts to look at the various options here and to make sure that what is installed is the proper design, both from the standpoint of moving traffic efficiently and economic development. Some of the speakers tonight have talked about how critical it is that our businesses have easy access to our highways. Um, recognizing how important the boulevard is to the economic development and the economic growth of downtown, the chamber very strongly supports the plan to get this completed by 2014. We think 2014 is very important because we need as very, very good access as soon as possible downtown. Thank you. Thank you, and Steve, I do, from the, from the Department of Transportation, I want to, you know, just like our, our partners at the City of Oklahoma City, the, the Chamber of Commerce has been a very good partner to the DOT over the years as we work through these very large projects. We may not always agree on everything, but we always work together well to come up with the best solution. I appreciate you taking your time. Hi, my
My name, my name is Bill Hughes. We have a rail plan for Oklahoma City. It'd be about $5 billion state of the art, uh, like they have in Dallas. And I'd like to build upon the issue that that's already been raised is that we're under, under designing downtown. Said the convention center is no bigger than the one that's there, essentially. Part of it's below ground. With, with our humidity, it's going to drive people up the wall. We need a convention center where the farmer's co-op is or the producer's co-op is, and we need to face that situation now and buy that property now. Otherwise, we're going to be held up on south downtown time and time again. Now, the issue is urban designers, and Eric should know, you cannot build, feed high-density retail downtown with a low-density traffic system. I have watched for 10 years now as rail has been locked out of the issue. If we're going to have a non-obsolete city, we've got to say no to the predatory auto dealers, and we've got to say we're going to do it right. And I call on everyone to say we're going to get the auto interests out of this picture completely, and we're going to design a first-class train system. Otherwise, we will always have something that's mediocre. Thank you. If I could, uh, a quick, Phil, I appreciate the comments. Uh, one of the things that we did not touch on, Eric touched on it a little bit. I, I think we did not bring it up in tonight's meeting, but I, I'd be remiss if we didn't. Touched on the hub study going on with the Santa Fe Depot. Um, as far as rail goes, uh, the, the state and the city together, they have their streetcar system that's being worked on. We're also looking with the Federal Railroad Administration, looking at a corridor between Oklahoma City and Tulsa, uh, whether it's on the existing state-owned rail line or whether it's on uh, a new alignment north of the Turner Turnpike. Those are ongoing federal studies. And Oklahoma City and Tulsa and the state as a whole are trying to position ourselves so that if funds are available and these things can be built at some point in the future, certainly they're not things that are going to be built in the next two, three, or five years, but things way in the future, we're trying to account for these, whether that's an underpass for a boulevard coming under, whether to uh, plan accordingly so that that Santa Fe Depot can be utilized not only for Amtrak but high speed and commuter and a streetcar system. Those are the exact parallel studies that are going on, and we, we're working with the city of Oklahoma City in partnership to uh, bring some of those things to fruition. And I don't think anyone's crystal ball can tell us what's going to come in those areas, but I do think we need to keep our eyes open and be prepared for the future to see what it brings. Brenda? My name is Stan Carroll. Uh, I want to applaud you guys on the area uh, east of Lee Avenue. I think it's in a, going in a great direction. I'm kind of a four-lane four proponent. But the area I'd like to visit about today is the area west of Lee Avenue, and that's the elevated portion. Um, I was noticing on uh, Mr. Streb's slideshow earlier, he, he flashed up the, uh, the wording of the actual decision document, and good thing I'm a, I'm a good reader because I believe I saw the terms at grade boulevard uh, in the first line there, but I couldn't read quick enough because it was so... We'll pull it right back up for you. Yeah. Um, six lane at grade boulevard, right, yeah. And so um, I think there may be a semantics issue. Um, I took a quick poll in preparation for this meeting to try to understand what people thought of when they thought of the term boulevard as well as the term at grade. And uh, for, regarding at grade, everybody I polled, and I polled about 15 people, everybody there considered at grade meaning at the primary level of surface around that area. So anything up on a berm or anything elevated so you can actually drive under it, no one that I polled considered that to be at grade. Um, also, regarding the boulevard, um, um, I also took a poll there, and the way people generally described it, and it was kind of a consensus because there was a lot of variation, but they were generally uh, in consensus by saying that it's a prominent street fronted by thriving businesses with vibrant pedestrian traffic. That was kind of the summation of, of how people generally cons uh, thought of a term boulevard. So. In order to have that definition of an at-grade boulevard, it's impossible to satisfy that definition for the areas east of Lee with the existing schemes that have been shown. 
And I, and I think we tend to agree, Stan, on that. If, you'll put the, if you could put that back up for me, please. I think this is one of the challenges that we face in this record of decision slide. It says from west of Walker to Western. Keep reading. From west of Walker to Western Avenue, the existing I-40 bridge will be maintained. So I think conceptually you're correct. I mean, the idea was a six-lane boulevard, but I think as we proposed to the city council and, and as, as we were challenged on why ODOT proceeded with a bridge design, it was only based on the record of decision documents as to why ODOT went that, that direction. And so we actually have retracted that. So I mean, I know I've mentioned that twice tonight. Clearly we've received from the public comments about the Western Avenue area and we're gonna study that. It's, it's not going to be from west of Walker to Western an existing I-40 bridge to be rehabilitated. That's not going to work. Um, we also don't believe an elevated at grade is going to completely work all by itself either. And so I, I just bring that back up, whether it's at grade, roundabout, partials. I mean, we're, we're gonna have a lot of information in the next couple of months. So just let me give you that reassurance. And, and I think from the city's perspective, you know, as we receive these comments tonight, I just want you to know that we really appreciate this. This dialogue is very good for us. The city of Oklahoma City and its partner with ODOT, I mean, this is why we have to have your input tonight. We need to make sure that we validate the decision-making process, that what, uh, what we're working together on is something that is gonna be delivered to you is what you've expected. And so, again, we're, we're writing notes and taking comments. And, and as I reinforce what David started with on this process, if you have written comments, please leave those as well. We've got to incorporate all this into the final design. In, in fairness to a lot of the folks that came here, maybe wanted to talk to us one-on-one -on -one back at some drawings, uh, I'd, I'd ask that we just take uh, one or two more questions uh, before we break out uh, to do some individual. And Hi, my name is uh, Ryan Johnston. I'm a real estate developer on uh, Sheridan and Western area. And uh, in, re in kind of relation to a few comments here tonight on that on that western entrance to downtown, um, I I wanted to address the fact that uh, you know what was once uh, very underdeveloped, um, you know a lot of really frankly junky old buildings have been rehabilitated in the last five years um, by me and by several different individuals, and there have been probably tens of millions of dollars poured in. Uh, you know, between Western and the Virginia, um, and between Sheridan and Maine. And a lot of these small business owners have taken a lot of pride in redeveloping a lot of these uh, really cool buildings and bringing them back to kind of um, very high standards. And so I wanted to make everybody aware that there are a lot of us that are really, really working hard to gentrify that area. and. I think I would speak for all of us when we say that uh, you know the overpasses and not having um, lights, for instance, at at, at Virginia, Indiana, Klein. Uh, if you want this, if the city wants this stuff to continue, and the city wants this development to continue, then they need to make a choice. They need to make a choice if they want more tax dollars or just to leave it like it is. Because if it's going to be left like it is, and there's going to be overpasses, then it's going to remain uh, unsightly in some areas. And uh, finally, you know, I, I think that uh, the, uh, there's, there's a lot to realize if somebody's driving out of town from, from downtown all the way to the stockyards to get on the expressway. I mean, that's a, stockyards has been here for a hundred years and it's, it could be the western edge of downtown and there could be a lot of development that goes on in there. And so to me, it's a choice. And to localize you know, the DuPont Circle and the Vegas comments, which I actually agree with, I thought that was great, but this boulevard should be more Northwest Expressway than, uh, you know, than it is right now. And access to other businesses, residences, and so on and so forth, with other, you know, and, with, and make the best out of that uh, mile stretch from Penn to Western. Thanks for having this discussion. Thank you. Any other questions? Clinton, over here. Uh, I'm Mark Gardner. I, uh, uh, I have an interest in the area, and, uh, and all these comments tonight, I think, have been absolutely wonderful. And, and it's great to see this many people out giving their opinion and their response to what's going on here. Uh, my view and my point that I'm going to make tonight, not necessarily a question, but, you know, when we use the 
comment of retainage and the elevated deal, it just really represents a barrier. And if we look now from where the old I-40 was, versus north versus south of the I-40, it was kind of a dividing line of, of development. And people just kind of stopped there and not much development went on further south of there. It was just kind of a mindset where people didn't do anything developing further south. So do we really want to create an elevated area where we create a bowl, because we already have an elevated area, we always have I-40, then we have another elevated area to where the development kind of becomes a no man's land. And like a lot of people have commented, there's a lot of wonderful buildings there, there's a lot of wonderful architecture there. I mean, look what they did to the, look at the area that was uh, the, the, the film area here over on Main Street that they took over there. And look how wonderful that's come up. And there's some new, you know, Slice Magazine put their building there. There's some other big, some other people have moved into the area and that development has gone there. Well, I, so the thing is, is that encouraging development obviously creates tax revenue for everybody, helps the city, helps everybody else. And that we've, we've got to keep that focus going. And, and the moving traffic, I understand, is important, but we're not interested. If you're in a hurry to get somewhere, you get on I-40. If you're coming through town, you go right through town to take care of business and to get there. So, you know, we're not in a hurry on, on the boulevard. We're, we're signs and development and stores and restaurants and, and you know, and opportunity for grocery stores downtown. And, and, you know, those things are needed with all the developments going on. And... Uh, so I think that we need to really, really focus on what's good for the next 20, 30 years of this city. Thank you. Thank you. Craig, over here. We've got two more, and then. Well, thank you. I'd like to go back a little ways, back to the years when the vision of Bricktown uh, and what is there now began when I heard Ray Ackerman, a great city leader, chairman of the Oklahoma City Chamber and the chambers here talked about a vision of a ballpark, a canal with boats going up and down it, just a new city. And then as you drive along the interstate, you can look down on this city. That seemed like an impossible task, but look, it came into a reality. Now that we've tore down I-40 and we've built a new I-40, sometimes, you know, I just wasn't as excited, even though the new I-40 is beautiful, because we can't we, we barely have a glimpse of a very excited Oklahoma City community. People, when they come through Oklahoma City, they always talked about, as I traveled to New York and different places, they always talked about, well, Oklahoma City is growing. Look at its businesses. Look at Bricktown. Look at the excitement of people downtown. I'm just saying to you that as we address this complex issue, from a citizen to you, not a business, I don't have a business along there, I wish we could grasp some of the old vision. I wish that at the core there was an elevated bridge so that when people come through Oklahoma City they have a choice to where they can go down and see what we've done. You've got the Oklahoma City Thunder, you've got a beautiful ballpark, and I think that all Oklahomans and people who travel through Oklahoma should, have, should be able to see that and be able to make a decision as an option. You know, can we get on I-40 or should we go down to Bricktown, do some shopping? It's tourism, it's capital gain. And I would just hope when considering this that we have some kind of elevated something that people can look down on because it's beautiful when you come across I-40 and I-44. As I come across it this morning, I looked down there and I said, look at the new skyline. Look at the vision of the past. Look at, what, look at what has been accomplished. And let's try to keep some of that where people come in, they can see all of what that vision was. Thanks. Thank you. Brenda? Uh, my name is Jeff Jenkins, and I'm an architect here in Oklahoma City, um, born and raised here, and just uh, really proud of what the city has done in the last 15 to 20 years. Um, we have one chance, as it was mentioned earlier during the presentation, we have one chance to do this right. Uh, I, I would hate to see the year 2014 be used as an artificial deadline to lock us into 
a less than ideal solution uh, to a very complex situation. A um, couple of observations. One, you've got this boulevard broken down into five different segments. There's a reason for that. There, there are many different uh, functions that this boulevard is going to have to serve and not every location is going to be the same. Um, I think that you should have the ability to be able to not just say we're going to have six lane boulevard all the way through or we're going to have a four lane boulevard all the way through. Maybe the right answer is six lanes in a couple of locations and four lanes in the rest. You need to have the freedom to be able to make that kind of decision regardless of what was written on a piece of paper 20 years ago. Um, the other thing that I would like to say is uh, think about Boulevard out of the box. If you go to Barcelona, the great Boulevard through Barcelona, you don't just have a median. It's not just a piece of grass with some trees in it that cars go by on either side. There are picnic tables in the middle. There are play people playing chess, people eating. Outside of the convention center, um, we, we don't necessarily need to have just a 40 lane, a 40 foot median in between lanes of traffic. Maybe that extra space that had been uh, drawn in that one presentation that I saw that was right up against the convention center, maybe that's pulled into the middle of the traffic lanes. And so someone mentioned, uh, oh, that makes it a long way to cross the street if, if you've got a 40-foot median and, and six lanes of traffic. Don't think of the median as a place to get through and get by. Think of it as an outdoor room for the city. This is a place to be. It's another part of that core to shore park. It's a part of the transition and the relationship between downtown and the river. It's not just a piece of grass that we have to spray weed killer on it to keep the grass from growing too much so we don't have to mow it. Uh, but that's a different soapbox. <laughs> Thank you. One more, Craig. All right, last but all right, last but not least, Bert McAnally, Oklahoma City Farmers Market. I would like to thank ODOT and the Let's city. move over here, Bart. All right. Here, Eric. There we go. All right, I'd like to thank ODOT and the city for having this. Kind of just kind of makes me smile, democratic process um, in action. Um, I question the current plans of the city to have a elevated at-grade boulevard from Pennsylvania to Western. Um, it was mentioned a couple of um, speakers before me. It would be kind of nice to have a, a, a boulevard that's elevated so you can look down at the city and see the progress that it's made. And that's all fine and good if you're down at the Corps to Shore area, but um, I don't think you really want to hang out and look at the, um, you know, from Pennsylvania to Western. It's not really that pretty. Um, and anything that's elevated is going to exacerbate the pre-existing problem, in my opinion. You've got an, if it's elevated and it has trees on it, it's, to me, it's tantamount about, you know, trying to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. It's still going to be elevated. It's still going to be a barrier for development south of that boulevard street. Um, I don't envy you your task and the engineers their task but I also have faith that um, something good is going to come out of this and something that's good that's going to come out of this five years, 10 years, 20 years. You know, prior proper planning, let's do that. Let's follow that old maxim of doing it right and doing it once and doing it right the first time. So with that, thank you for your time in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you.
I wanted to say from the Department of Transportation, uh, really appreciate the City of Oklahoma City's partnership and Eric's willingness to come up here and take all of the hard questions. Uh, that was very kind of him. Uh, but in, on a serious note, I appreciate the interest of all the folks that came tonight. We did our very best to make sure it was hard for you to get here. I believe Shields is closed tonight. And that's the major access point. Thank you, Paul. But uh, we did our very best. The interest is exciting. Uh, I do want to say, no matter what happens, no matter what the solution is, if it's a hybrid of everything you saw tonight or if it's one or the other, it's going to be a whole lot better than what is there today because there's nothing there today. We're going to end up with a much better facility for folks to use, whatever that ends up looking like. Uh, the level of interest is greatly appreciated. If you have comment sheets, drop them off on the way back. We will have another public meeting. I would like at this point all of the ODOT staff to stand up. Put your hand in the air, please. Put your hand up. I think a lot of them have name tags. Anybody that wants to stick around a little while, we'll give them a hand. But anybody wants to stick around a little while, uh, we're here to answer one-on-one -on -one questions because, frankly, a lot of folks don't like the microphone and don't like talking in public. Uh, we'd be happy to visit with you one-on-one -on -one and answer any individual questions you might have. Thank you very much for your patience.